So I know that's an exciting passage from Deuteronomy. You're all, oh wow. But it is a, a pretty radical passage. We have heard, what's mine is yours. Usually in a marriage relationship, sometimes it's said a little bit begrudgingly. Uh, sometimes it's said somewhat sarcastically. But when it is sincere, it is a good attitude to have toward our spouse. Now other couples need separate accounts and prenuptial agreements. That's part of the society that we live in, but that's a necessity. And normally we, we look at that a little suspiciously, but maybe that's actually a little bit more honest. For even if we do not separate our assets in some clear way, maybe we do that of our own accord. And we say, well, this is mine, and that little bit over there is yours. Even to those who genuinely share their goods with each other openly have really only extended their selfishness to go to their family as well. The most prevailing attitude in the United States is, what's mine is mine. Even worse, sometimes, it goes even further as people and corporations begin to think, well, what's yours is mine. Help us, Jesus. This seemingly boring passage from Deuteronomy is God shaking up the world economic system. But not just the worldly economic system, the personal one too. And I'll get to more about that in just a minute. Here we have this seven year debt cancellation cycle, what sometimes they refer to as the year of Jubilee or the year of the Lord. And it is there as a reminder to the people of God that the Creator is the true owner of all. So for those who trust in God, the best attitude is what's mine is God's. So why in the world do we have this passage to begin with? Well, I'm glad you asked, or at least thought of that. The, the Israelites of the day were fostering greedy, and covetous lifestyles. In the system of the day, the wealthy were taking advantage of those who were the poorest and most vulnerable. All the prophets of Israel condemned this behavior that was reoccurring generation after generation after generation. Sinful human nature is inherently selfish. That is, being self-interested and self-centered to the detriment of others around us. For this very reason, God commands a law to break the cycles of greed and oppression. In the seventh year, a creditor must give back the collateral they took from the borrower. That's good news for the borrower, not so good for the person who's lending. Now that does not mean the borrower, though, is off the hook. They are still required to pay. Rather, the land or asset that they put up cannot be held indefinitely as a safeguard to them. So I imagine the elite rulers of the time were not too excited about this law. Although they could still hold assets of foreigners indefinitely, so at least they had that going for them. They had someone they could continue to collect and, and push to get everything they were owed. Unfortunately, religious elites often went a step further, and not only were they selfish, but they went as far as exploiting those who had the least. The thought was the elites deserved it more than the lazy bums they were taking it from. After all, they and their families worked hard to amass their riches 
so that they could loan money to others for a price. And sometimes this spiraled out of control. This troubling attitude was not just a problem of the ancient Jews, but it's still an attitude alive and well today in every modern society. Taking advantage of people to get to the top or in order to acquire more wealth is ethically wrong and morally bankrupt. <coughs> And if you wonder who has the power in these type of relationships, we only need to think about who has more influence, you or the billionaires of today. Who has more sway, you or the Koch brothers, you or Warren Buffett, you or Bill Gates, you or the Waltons. The reality is that if I or any one of us contact a senator about a pressing issue, we're lucky to get a canned response. And on the other hand, if a billionaire has an issue, they'll get a personal meeting right away. Uh, so there's a, whether you like it or not, there's a power difference there. The what's mine is mine attitude is not one that went away after Jesus. Good Jews and good Christians continue to have moments of selfishness. Stewardship, therefore, works to reframe our self-centered mindset. This ancient passage reminds us that a God-fearing attitude is symbolized by an open hand instead of a clenched fist. And here, this open hand symbolizes generosity, the willingness to give. For with great wealth and resources comes great responsibility. God holds us accountable for the resources that we have been given. If we want to be fruitful disciples, we cannot close our fists and neglect those who are struggling around us. Everything we try to claim, the land, the water, the air, and everything in them, comes from our benevolent creator, the owner and creator of the entire cosmos. Moses here in Deuteronomy does not just put a law into place, but tries at length to stress our role as stewards rather than owners here on this earth. And Jesus does a similar thing with his parable about the talents, where those who are actively investing in the kingdom of God are rewarded. The warning that we have here in this passage is that we should not have hard hearts like that of Pharaoh and Judas. Instead, we are to have soft, that is, compassionate hearts, just as Jesus and his early disciples did. So to us, that looks like charity and generosity. And we see examples of this not only in Deuteronomy, but the Gospels and throughout our Scripture. Looking out not just for number one, but first and foremost for those who are vulnerable in society, the least and the last, those who truly need the help. And that is at the heart of the matter. Because we know that at the end of the day, the wealthy lender will be just fine if they didn't need confiscate the land that was put up as collateral or if they had not made the loan in the first place. They will still be able to survive and have good lives. Open hands and soft hearts can be a bit of a rub for those who subscribe to an unfettered model of capitalism. 
That's not to say that capitalism is bad, but that it can go too far. What's mine is yours is a good attitude for not only marriages, but also for us to have toward our neighbors. God is calling us to care for people and to not just care about the bottom line of our personal budgets or the bottom line at the company we work for or own. So I wonder, does paying a low minimum wage have people or profit as its main motivation? Do we give to the poor or organizations who help the underprivileged with reluctance? Well, I admit that I have questioned whether giving money to a homeless person or someone who is in a time of poverty is a good idea. And I've wondered if a person coming to me in crisis was actually deserving or if they were just going around scamming churches and people. Now, I do think it is wise for us to evaluate how we give and under what circumstances. But I confess that although at times I can be generous, <coughs> I sometimes don't want to work in my hand, especially for certain people at certain times. And I want to attest and say that I am truly thankful that this is a generous church and that we are a church filled with generous and charitable people. And that is something we can celebrate. Something that we should be proud of. Still, we know that our stewardship, both communal and individual, can use some shoring up. It can improve. This seven-year debt cycle, where release and liberation is given to those who need it, is much like the practice of tithing. For they are both exercises in letting go. Exercises in remembering where the goods and resources we have first come from. So they serve to us as practical reminders that we are not the ultimate owners of our resources, but that God alone owns us and everything we can see, touch, feel, taste, experience, and even imagine, and then so much more than that. To understand our own blessedness, we open our hands and soften our hearts to be a blessing for others. Friends, our Lord is gracious and generous to each and every one of us, much more than we deserve. So let us joyfully affirm what is mine is God's. So I'm going to invite us to say it together with open hands and soft hearts. What is mine is God's. Let's say it one more time. What is mine is God's. Lord, what is yours? We give back to you. Hallelujah.